Hello everybody, I'm Timtra, back again for another Humble Choice Bundle review. As always, for the May 2021 Humble Choice Bundle, I played each of the games for between 30 minutes to an hour in order to get my first impressions on them. I'm going to go through the games in the order that they are listed out by Humble, meaning headliners first, and give my general thoughts and impressions on them, as well as things like what type of games they are like, and who they would appeal to, and whether they were a good addition to the bundle or not. And at the end, I will sum up my overall thoughts on the bundle in the conclusion. I have a lot to talk about, so let's not waste any more time in the intro. The first headliner is Metro Exodus, and this is a big rip for me, because just a few weeks ago, I got it in a different sale. <sighs> well, you know, that's how it goes, c'est la vie. You win some, you lose some. Now, for those of you unfamiliar with the Metro franchise, they are survival horror games set within the ruins of the Moscow Metro after a nuclear war devastates the world. I won't get into the plots of the previous two games here, although I highly, highly, highly recommend that you play them. However, this game sees the main character of the previous games and their allies actually escape the metro on a quest across Russia to try and reach the Ark, where they believe the Russian government has rebuilt itself. The game features a mixture of linear levels and sandbox environment. Metro always had more open-ended level design, but now that you're out of the confines of those metro tunnels, it really seems that aspect is expanded upon much more in this game. Being an apocalyptic survival game, you also have to scavenge guns and supplies, as well as use crafting materials to upgrade your weapons. It's got a bunch of realistic mechanics, like having to wear a gas mask to prevent radiation, or having to clean your guns to prevent jamming. It's also just a very beautiful game, and it's got a really gritty atmosphere which just goes perfectly with the setting. Now, let's just get this out of the way. This game, for most people, is going to be the main draw for buying the bundle. I always love to see Humble nailing it with the headliners. That's been one of my criticisms of the previous few bundles. And just not having good headliners. I think headliners are one of the most important aspects of the bundle. Now, despite it being the third game in the franchise, I feel like that actually isn't that big of a barrier to entry, since both Metro 2033 and Metro Last Light have gone on so many good sales over the years, and I think both of them have been free on the Epic Game Store, like twice in the you know last few years which is just nuts i would imagine that many people who are not even super into metro have at least the first two games in this franchise in their libraries already now this is definitely worth the price of the bundle alone that's not really a hot take i think it's pretty obvious to a lot of people i definitely highly recommend this game from a biased metro fan i haven't had a chance to play it yet um i just did my you know first impressions but um i already was really loving it in the time that i played and as a last note here, anyone who owns the PC version is now entitled to the enhanced edition of this game, so if you have a ray tracing capable GPU, this might be a great game to get just to benchmark it and test out how it looks. Darksiders Genesis is the second headliner, it's an action adventure hack and slash game. I've heard of this franchise a little bit before, I have Darksiders 3 in my backlog, but I really haven't had a chance to play any of them before. Being the first game in the franchise, I was a little lost on the story until I did a bit of research. So you play as both War and Strife, two of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, who try to maintain balance in the universe by preventing either angels or demons from becoming more powerful than one another. In this game, Lucifer is up to no good again, trying to kill humanity like the little rascal he is, and you have to stop him. I had a lot of fun with this game, it kind of reminded me of Torchlight 2 with less loot and more focus on like the story. Probably because I played the Outlander a lot in Torchlight 2, uh, who is the guy with the guns, and I enjoyed playing Strife in this game, who is also the one with the guns. This game is probably better played in co-op or online co-op if possible because I found switching between the characters on the fly uh, a bit unwieldy, but it was still doable. Similarly, activating the special moves was a bit tough for the same reason as well, because you have to hit one of the bumper buttons first and then hit the spe special activation like shortly afterwards, you can't just do it at the same time. It does look like you get more abilities as the game goes on though, even in the time that I spent in my first impressions, I got this cool glaive for war, the swords guy, and for the other one I got a charge shot, and there looked like there was plenty of space on the weapon wheel for more upgrades. If you like hack and slash games or are familiar with this franchise, this is definitely a good add to the bundle. The third headliner here is Hellpoint, which is a Souls-like game set in a dark sci-fi setting. It's kind of like the grimdark of Warhammer 40k mixed with the creepy abandoned spaces and ruined castles of Dark Souls games, especially in the setting. The wretched derelict space station Irid Novo has got a really metal feel to it, having a very brutal and gothic architecture and atmosphere. It also orbits around a black hole and that is metal as hell. The graphics do look a bit dated, but I'm the type of person who can look over that if the world design and the feel of the game are good, and I think Hellpoint makes up for it with those. 
So if you've ever played a Souls game, many things here will be familiar. Hidden passages, shortcuts, boss rooms, collecting souls by killing monsters to spend at the space bonfire to level up your stats. The combat was also decent from what I could see, but you know, I didn't really make it too far into the game, so take that with a grain of salt. Um, and I think that you can get guns later in the game, basically the replacement for magic. So I'm pretty excited about that. I think it'll be a cool little addition. Some things that I noticed were different from the main Souls games were that after a while, enemies actually respawn in areas that I had already cleaned out without me going back to a bonfire and, you know, reloading. I'm curious to see how that affects the gameplay of clearing areas and, you know, whether some different strategies evolve because of that. Another thing I noticed was that your space Estus flask uh, recharges based on killing enemies, which is neat and might pair well with the respawning enemies, right? So you might not even need to go back to a bonfire to refill your Estus, you could maybe just kill some enemies on the way. If you have the skill to avoid damage, you might come out of fights with even more Estus than you started. The last thing that I noticed in my playtime was that if you die, a shadow version of yourself spawns to guard your dropped souls. And honestly, that seems like a pretty cool idea. It's like having a little mini boss to screw you extra hard for being a failure. Lastly, this game has split screen co-op on top of having online co-op and online PvP, which is a massive bonus. Being able to just hook up another controller and play with a friend on the same system is not something that is common anymore, and I can't even think of any Souls-like games that have done it. So if you have a friend who also likes Souls-likes, then one of you getting this to play together would definitely be worth the price of the bundle. Overall, if you like Souls likes, absolutely check Hellpoint out. The game normally goes for around 40 bucks, so getting it for $12 on top of some other great games is just a steal of a deal. Before we move on to the last headliner here, if you've enjoyed the video so far, be sure to go down and drop a like or even subscribe so that you can be notified when more humble reviews come out. I also do more long form game reviews and other miscellaneous side projects that I think are pretty fun. I'm looking to expand more into doing VR reviews and gameplay in the future as well. If any of that interests you, consider subscribing so that you can be notified. And even if you don't subscribe, I just want to thank you for watching this video. Any support or interest is much appreciated. Alright, now let's get back to the review. Cook Serve Delicious 3 is a cooking management game where you dish out hundreds of really tasty looking foods from your food truck. It's kind of like overcooked in some respects, although the main challenge comes from having to prepare and serve your orders really fast through hitting combinations of keys on your keyboard. The main loop is that on your way to your food truck stop, you have a chance to prepare custom orders as well as food that you can't really predict how many people will order it, the orders will just come in as long as you have time to make them. But you really can't stock up too much because the food will go bad and you only have limited slots to cook and store your food in. Once the prep phase is over and you arrive at your destination, you turn in the custom orders you were able to make as well as feed all the customers you can with your stocked up stuff, all while trying to create new food to replace what is going out. After a while the truck starts again and you move into another prep phase as the truck moves towards the next stop. It does a great job at creating that a frantic uh, kind of feeling as you have to stay on your toes and you're always having to prepare more food. You are really going to need to practice with this game because I actually found it quite difficult. This was my first cook serve delicious game and you know I did all right in the tutorial but once I got out of the tutorial levels I just got absolutely destroyed. One thing I started to realize towards the end of my time, uh, it seems that you should not be using your mouse. I lost so much time moving my hand from my mouse to hit the enter key to put away the order I was working on. Training your muscle memory and reaction time to be able to hit your keys correctly and create the dishes accurately and efficiently is going to be essential to be successful in this game. It was brutal, but I enjoyed the game and the challenge, and I'm probably going to come back to this one after I'm done the review. I was a little bit skeptical at first when I was reading the reactions on Reddit, but I can definitely see why this would attract people to the bundle. Level Head is a precision platformer where you, as an employee of the Intergalactic Bureau of Shipping, have to run through levels as a little robot called GR18, bringing a package that spawns in the level to the end. The game has a lot of charm and really won me over with its introduction no matter the circumstance. Now, if you'll reach under your seat, you'll find a brand new GR-18. Full started to begin the boot up sequence. GR-18 bonds for life to its owner when turned on. Look into its eyes. Excellent work. With the bonding process finished, your job is now to complete every level in the Bureau of Shipping's training program. 
build and share your own levels. And rise the platforming here is interesting and has some good mechanics like the ability to use this little arm appendage to yoink items from a distance. You can also use the package that you're delivering in unique ways by throwing it or magnet jumping. But I think the really cool thing about this game is the level editor. It's really extensive and allows people to build a huge variety of levels that they can share with on the in-game workshop. Unfortunately, for some reason this game it doesn't have the uh, Steam Workshop enabled, you can't really just go in and easily browse games, which I really don't like. I, I know it's okay to have like, you know, an in-game workshop feature, but they really should just let you, you know, go in outside the game and download levels. Now regardless, um, I'm not a huge fan of level building myself, but from the looks of it, it really gets in depth. It's like Super Mario Maker on PC. There's even a whole system of switches and wiring that allows you to customize how objects behave. If you like platformers or building levels, I would definitely check this one out. Last month, I complained about Colt Canyon being a pretty bland roguelike, and it seems that Humble kind of came in with a complete reversal this month with Fury Unleashed. Uh, it's a really good roguelike that differentiates itself from other games in the genre. The enemies and weapons were really interesting, and there were several mechanics that I felt were pretty cool. For example, instead of always just giving you loot when you open a chest, there are these chests that when you open them they give you a mission, that you have to complete as you go through the level, and doing so will give you the rewards, so it kind of changes things up and forces you to play differently, like making you finish off the next five enemies with a melee attack or something. There's also a big emphasis on moving fast and building your combo meter, which gives you damage resistance and healing when you reach certain combo levels. There also seems to be a good amount of progression as you play, with being able to level up your character when you die so that in your next run you come back stronger. And you'll definitely need to be paying attention to your leveling choices, because I actually found this game to be pretty hard, which I liked as well. If you like roguelike games, absolutely check this one out. Size Matters is a quick little game with a pretty cool concept. You are a scientist who has drunk a shrinking potion, and you need to brew the antidote before you shrink to nothingness. The more time you take, the harder it will be to complete the antidote due to your size, so you'll need to stack boxes and prepare the room so that when you are smaller you can still reach your instruments and navigate. It's pretty cool, you can kind of see yourself shrinking and they even have a little counter that shows your current height and you can see it going down, it's, it's just really cool to see. I had a lot of fun with this game, so if you're worried about the potion recipes being complicated, don't. It's just more of a time management, uh, race against the clock type game, rather than something where you have to memorize recipes or like actual science. The Steam store has this tagged as like science and education, which is pretty hilarious because you're like using stuff called like cringonium, <laughs> which is like, and all these things are totally fake and there's actually no science in this game. But, but regardless to that, the uh, main challenge comes from finding the recipe pieces and kind of managing the ingredients and just kind of trying to figure out what combines with what. There's nothing to really tell you, yeah, this potion is in the third stage of the recipe, that's why you don't have it yet. You kind of have to figure that out by looking at everything in front of you. There aren't really levels, it's mainly just different difficulty settings, but these can be kind of thought of as different levels since going from beginner to normal mode doubled the amount of potions that I had to brew. So I imagine harder difficulties uh, make it even more hectic. I also saw some of the difficulties down the line had modifiers like low gravity, so that could potentially change up the gameplay a ton. This is definitely a pretty cool game just based on its concept alone. I wouldn't buy the bundle for this game, but if you are going to buy the bundle for another game, I would definitely download this and check it out. Also, a little side note here, I feel like this game would work really well as a VR port, so if any of the devs are listening, uh, check that out. That might be a great idea. Next up, Morkred. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, Morkred is a neat little puzzle game where you take control of these two shades and have to guide this light ball through various puzzles. The puzzles themselves aren't that complicated, but the main mechanic is what makes the game challenging. You see, the shades pretty much die instantly when they leave the light, so you have to watch out for shadows cast by objects in the environment and your other shade that you're controlling. This game is probably played better in co-op, which seems to be the main intended mode. I played in single player as always because I am forever alone, and it kind of prevented a different type of challenge. I imagine in co-op this game would be really great to play with a friend or a significant other because you would be accidentally killing each other with your character's shadows, and it would kind of create that chaos that co-op games thrive on. Whereas here, um, using only one player 
Controlling two characters with one controller, it was more of a test of concentration, uh, trying to manage two control sets at once. Not a bad time, but probably less fun than co-op. This game actually has a progress meter in it, and judging by the fact that I got 20% through in 30 minutes, the game probably is only going to take about two and a half hours to get through. I enjoyed my time with this game. Uh, if you like puzzle co-op games, you'll probably like this one, but I wouldn't get the bundle for it as it's a little bit short. Relicta is a puzzle platformer that takes place on a moon base that never really feels like a moon base. Like, yeah, it says in game that you're in terraform domes, but it just feels like you're teleporting between biomes, like at least put a dome in the skybox rather than having a generic sky texture that doesn't make sense for a moon base. But I guess that's just a little nitpick that I wanted to get out of the way. The gameplay focuses around solving puzzles using magnetism and gravity manipulation. Blue and red are opposite magnetism polarities and you can turn the gravity on and off of objects. Opposite magnetism colors attract and the same color repels, just like, you know, using one of those little magnets that you get in elementary school. A simple example of this in action is attaching a box to a magnetized section of the wall, turning off its gravity, standing on it, and then making it the same polarity so that it flies off the wall across the chasm with you on top. Now, there is a story, but I didn't really care for it all that much. I'm here to solve puzzles, not care about some random scientist's daughter. Although I did have a minor gripe in that I felt like the dialogue sometimes felt a bit forced, trying a bit too hard to be funny or relatable, but maybe that's just me. If you like casual puzzle games like Portal 1 and 2, take a look at Relicta. Next up is Retimed, which follows the time-honored tradition of every game where time manipulation is the main mechanic in putting a reference to chronological time in the title. This is a multiplayer and co-op casual platforming shooter. It's pretty simplistic and if you've played any game similar to this one, you can probably already understand the gist of it just from seeing this gameplay. The defining trait is the time warping mechanic, which basically slows down time in a bubble around the player when they are in danger, allowing them time to dodge or even fire back. The battles revolve around jumping around the stage, collecting ammo, and trying to outshoot and outdodge your opponent. It's not the most complicated game nor the best in its genre, but I had decent fun. The time warping mechanic does have some neat side effects. It can be a benefit and a drawback. For example, the one in the bubble has time to dodge, but the time warp also slows their movement down, so the other player can take more time to line up a follow-up shot that won't be dodgeable. The main issue with this game that kind of prevents me from praising it too much is that the fun is really in multiplayer. The single player mode is just killing waves of enemies that like drop into the map. There's no player AI so it's pretty boring. And the issue with multiplayer is very low player count. On bundle release day I was only able to find one match with one person in my 30 minutes. You might get a couple of hours of fun out of this but honestly there are better co-op games and the real fun of the game, the multiplayer, is dead on arrival. Humble, please stop putting dead multiplayer indies in your humble bundles. Their multiplayer community never gets revived just from being shoveled to a bunch of people. It's just a waste of our time. The 11th game in this bundle is Family Man, and this game highlights the wisdom of the good old adage, don't judge a book by its cover. Behind these unturned ass looking graphics actually lies a decent game. In Family Man, you play as a guy who unwittingly loses almost everything and gets tied up with gangsters. The main gameplay loop revolves around going into town to get enough money to pay them off each day, and the money owed each day keeps going up. You earn money by working jobs in town, completing quests for the locals, or just by collecting junk to sell and doing other activities like that. You also have to manage your time carefully as time moves fast. Doing certain activities like working shifts at the burger joint automatically passes in-game time, so the end of the day can easily take you by surprise. And here's the kicker, if you miss one payment to the gangsters, you lose. It's also a bit like Papers, Please in the having to take care of your family aspect and having to make moral choices in order to support yourself and your family, as there are more illegal ways of making money that will affect your family and the town if you keep doing them. You have to provide them with food to eat, medicine, and pay attention to their emotional needs, you also need to take care of the chores around your house before heading off into town. The story is quite simple, but I found the game pretty fun, and I played longer than I expected, especially since I had limited time to record. If you like games where you have to make tough choices and manage your time and resources, check Family Guy out. <laughs> check Family Man out, I'm gonna leave that in, that's funny. Okay, now the last main indie game here is Vane. Now, Vane is a very cerebral puzzle exploration walking simulator type game. 
you explore a ruined world as a bird and then you go into these magical piles of gold and transform into a kid where you have to do platforming. If that sounds vague, it is. Because the story and what you're supposed to do in the game start off very vague and I wasn't really able to figure out much. The beginning is very slow and there's very little direction as to what to do. Now that in itself is fine, but because the map is very large and relatively empty, I found it frustrating to just fly around in circles and try figuring out what to do. There were some moments that did genuinely interest me though, um, and at times the music was very nice. Towards the end of my allotted time, I did start to like it more, and the feeling of discovering what to do genuinely was pretty nice. How Long to Beat has the main story at roughly two and a half hours, so this could be a good few hours of fun if you're into walking sims. Although honestly, based on my own experience and the mixed Steam reviews, I feel like this is either a game that you're going to love or hate. Like others in the Steam reviews, I found the camera angles and controls, especially when playing as the kid, very annoying. The kid moves very slowly and just doesn't feel like they're interacting with the terrain right at times, making basic platforming frustrating and tedious. For me, the jury is still out on this game. May's DRM free game is Summertime Madness, and I think this game is being given away kind of as a sneak preview since it's on Steam and says it's going to release on June 17th. The basic concept is that you're a painter in Prague during World War II who has probably gone insane from the war and who makes a deal with the devil in order to enter his own paintings as an escape from the world. But there's a catch. If you don't escape the canvas in 6 hours, you'll be trapped there forever, meaning there's a time limit on beating the game. As a quick side note here, I'm not sure if this is a mistake, a sign that the protagonist is insane, or just that the game takes place in an alternate reality. The Steam description says that this takes place in July 1945, but the war in Europe during World War II ended in May 1945, so not sure what's going on there. I thought I was going insane when I looked until I looked this up because I was like, that is not how I remember it was, right? So yeah, not sure about that, but the history buff in me kind of got triggered by that, and I just had to point it out. But anyway, I would say that this is the first good DRM free game in a few months. It's an actual polished looking game with a good concept with the having a limited time to beat aspect, right? Um, the only issue is that the puzzles seem to be a bit brute forcey. Like maybe I'm just not good at puzzles, but it focuses on very abstract type puzzles, like having to rotate some of the rings in a particular order so that you can walk across them in a walkway or having to turn on all these candles at the same time, but you know, turning one on flips another off or flips another two on. So you need to kind of figure out what the correct pattern is. I don't really like these pattern type puzzles. Like for half of these, I just kind of played around with them until it worked. I didn't even understand the concept behind this one with these spinning cogs. It literally gives no indication of what impact changing the spin of the cogs really does, right? Like you would expect it to kind of give you like, oh, like this thing changed, but nothing really changed in here when I like was flipping these cogs around until it just suddenly worked. But while this game might not be my cup of tea, I can definitely see why some puzzle fans might be interested in it. The six hour time limit might be an interesting challenge to fans of the genre, and there's an even a three hour time limit mode for the brave out there. Definitely not a bad addition. Alright guys, we've reached the conclusion. Thank you for sticking with me until the end here. I think it's about time for me to give my general thoughts on the bundle. I think this is a very strong bundle. At first glance, the headliners really steal the show, which is what I like to see. Metro Exodus has a broad appeal and is a well-established franchise. If you are even slightly interested in it, that makes getting the bundle worth it alone. It's unlikely to go below $12 for at least a year or two, so this is definitely a great deal for Metro alone. But then you also have Darksiders Genesis and Hellpoint, which are great for fans of hack and slash and souls-like games. I don't know about the rest of you guys, but Hellpoint feels like the perfect example of a game that I would be hesitant to buy by itself, but when it comes in a bundle for only around $12, it just feels so much more worth it. But then there are also games in the supporting cast, which really surprised me when I played them. Family Man, Relicta, Fury Unleashed, Size Matters, and I guess Cook Serve Delicious, although that was one of the headliners, were much more enjoyable than I was expecting them to be. We also got a good DRM free game that actually felt like something that would be worthy of being on Steam, unlike the previous two which were just ripoffs of other games. 
Level head was fine, but I'm not really into level building or platformers, so it's not for me, but I definitely recognize why some people would really enjoy it. It has a lot of polish and comprehensive tools to build levels, and a great charm and aesthetic. Mokred was fine too, but it feels pretty short, and the main light and shadow mechanic, while somewhat interesting for a bit, really isn't that innovative. I'm That's probably been done a million times before. It doesn't seem like something super new. None of the games in this bundle were really offensive to me, but if I had to pick the worst games, I would say that Retimed is one, simply because the best way to play is locked behind a multiplayer with pretty much no players, or playing with friends in co-op. But let's be honest, if you're spending time to play co-op games with a friend, there are way better games to spend that time playing. Vane would probably be the other one I pick, just because while it's not bad, it really is dreadfully slow, and the controls and camera issues really hamper the enjoyment of the exploration and platforming, which are the main aspects of the game, right? That about wraps up my thoughts on this bundle. It was a very good month, and I hope we get to see more like this in the future. It's really important, in my opinion, to nail those headliners like they did, and it just adds a cherry on top when you get some pleasant surprises from the indie games. Here's to next month being just as good. I really hope that you found this video helpful. It's a real grind to try and get these reviews done by the weekend. Thanks to Humble changing the release date for our choice bundles to Tuesday. But if you did find it helpful, be sure to leave a like or maybe even subscribe so that you can be notified for more Humble reviews. Wherever you are, have a great day and I'll see you guys on the next one.